hello yes so today we are going to do part two of this series okay where we are trying to understand how to find smallest generating sets of special kinds of semigroups okay we want to start with a semigroup it could be it could be a very concrete object it could be a collection of functions it could be some set of functions from a finite set let's say of size n to another finite set of size n and we want to find how what what is the smallest number of functions you need to start with and do compositions and get all the functions okay this is a question this has been the goal for us to answer okay from the very beginning that's the motive which with this with which this is set out okay now in part 1 we saw the theory we saw the theory of simple semigroups completely simple semigroups structure theory how you could look at them as some matrices and so on we did the ries matrix theorem that was probably the main thing that we'll be using and of course some things about their r classes how the r classes become ideals because of the simplicity so they are like you know one piece you know one one ideal one d class and yeah but today we will start with the actual question actual question of find the generating sets okay and of course i'll also we'll also first explain why we did simple semigroups to start with why did we study the properties of those semigroups which don't have any ideals why and why would why would we do that okay. we'll explain these things uh, so yeah let's get started but before uh, we really get into the theory we of course we'll first start with some definitions okay so the first definition is just the formalization of what i've been saying start with the smallest set and so on okay so this is the so given a semi group so semi group s now can i stand so can be a concrete thing as i'm trying to say it's not just abstract it's not abstract theory the theory itself is quite beautiful and so on so you start with a semi group s and you want to understand what is the rank of the semi group now what what's the definition of this so as you can understand you know you're looking at those sets a you know you're looking at a set a okay such that using a you can generate s and then you record the size of the that a size of the set and you take the smallest size okay so when i say generate what do i mean i mean i can you can just give a very quick example as follows so when i say not if not really an example so when i say generate i mean let's say a had these things a1 a2 a3 and what are you allowed to do while generating that's need to understand i mean it's obvious that we need to just we can just take like products like these we can take squares and these and you can take this and so on you can take products of arbitrary long lengths okay formally at least now there may be relations in semi group and they may get killed but that's a different thing okay. now obviously what you're not allowed to do is inverses because you don't know if they have inverses if they have inverses then yeah you can okay okay if they have inverses then also there is a problem okay but for the time being in general they won't have inverses and so we'll have to just you know do these things okay. this is different from generating the ideal from a okay when you generating the ideal from a then you would have to do something like this meaning that you you can multiply things from s on the left and the right okay and you pick an element of a and multiply things on the left and the right okay so this is this that's different okay it's different so what we are trying to understand is what is the smallest number of things that you need to start with what's the smallest generating size of the smallest generating set okay. so um well uh, since we are looking at transformation semi groups the most obvious thing to start with is would be the would be tn now tn is just a set of all functions from n to n but we will not start with that we will instead start with sn Uh, sn is as you, people have studied the language of group theory would know but even otherwise we all know this object like this is just a set of all permutations on n on a set of size n okay all bijections from n to n we will be first so this is the group right this is the group this has invertibility and so on this is a group part of tn okay and we will first be finding the generators for this and we will see that this is a general theme in semi group theory in when finding ranks of semi groups is you take the group part of the semi group there is a well defined notion of that and you find that 
generating set of that and then you sort of do something called the relative rank okay but let's first come down to this con very very concrete problem what's the rank of sn okay what is the rank of sn what all do you need to get in all all permutations okay now of course there is some very uh, obvious lower bounds that one can start with okay so for example one can just uh, one knows this right and any permutation is is generated by transpositions so this is a very well known result you basically you have a permutation a complicated permutation you can just do swaps you can just do swaps and you can get all your permutation either you have that permutation by series of swaps right and there, there's a proper way to do that as well algorithmically but this is something that we'll assume yeah. now every transposition can be generated by transfer every, sorry every so start with every permutation can be generated by transpositions so now how many transpositions are there right so this is i and j so you understand it's n choose 2 so we already have a lower bound that is n choose 2 so certainly n choose 2 is enough sorry an upper bound right this is and this is an upper bound n choose 2 is enough so our actual answer should maybe this or maybe lower than this okay let's see but it's in fact certainly lower than this because here is the key okay that every transposition can be generated by what is known as consecutive transpositions okay now this is just a name i gave so consecutive transpositions are transpositions of the form i and i plus 1 okay which is roughly saying that you just change two consecutive places this is also quite obvious if you think about it if you want to swap two places you can just change swap consecutive places quite a number of times and maybe they end up swapping the two places yeah so if you assume this yeah if you assume this then it's true that the rank will be less than equal to n minus 1 because there are only n minus 1 of these things so right so you start with the obvious bounds so we're not coming up with some i'm trying to not come up with some direct you know surprise answer surprise construction but just saying that start with transpositions which is the natural thing to think because this is the maybe the only result we know about generating permutations in a typical group theory thing and then you come to the consecutive transpositions in trying to reduce a number and let's see if you can do better okay um yeah but i think uh, before that let me just give an example as to why you can actually generate every every transposition with consecutive transpositions okay because then every permutation you can write with consecutive transpositions right? let's just take an example because it may be not very clear not very obvious if someone looks at it very group theoretically maybe um yeah right okay so let's see so suppose you have let's say you have 1 comma 5 okay so you want one to go to 5 and you want 5 to go to 1 that, that that's all the rest rest of the things you want to fix right so if you want something like this then how can you get this so you are only allowed to use consecutive transpositions so certainly you can start with sending maybe you can start with sending 1 to 2 right now if you, if you if you're going to send 1 to 2 now nah, but uh one second so you should be writing it like this i believe yeah 1 to 2 right so you send 1 to 2 and then you can send 2 to 3 okay and 3 to 4 and 4 to 5 Okay. Now, why I'm writing it in this order? Because if I write here two to three, then in fact one will not go to two. One will go to three, which is, I mean, uh, okay. So I think this is fine. Sorry. So one goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes to four, and four goes to five. Yeah, this is fine. Okay. Actually, yes, we did want that. So sorry, this is good enough. But then you see there is a. We need to make some additions to this because, what happens to two? Right. Two. goes to 1 that's certainly not certainly something that you don't want right we don't want 2 to go to 1 we want 2 to go to 2 okay so when 2 goes in the input here 2 goes to 1 so you need to make an adjustment here right and you need to just do this 1 to 2 once again so that finally 2 goes to 2 now you have 2 goes to 3 okay so you know to uh, sorry so when 3 comes in it goes to 2 2 has been taken care of when 3 comes in it goes to 2 right and now you want it to go to 3 so you just do this and you can see the pattern like this now my claim is that everything is all right okay 
everything is all right. Four will go to four, and everything three will go to three, and so on. And you can check this. This certainly works. And one is going to five. That's not disturbed. That's why we didn't do anything with related to five here in the end. Okay. So that is the idea. So it can be done, and you can notice that you will always need an odd number of permutations. It's kind of like you do some, you do the adjustment to send one to five using consecutive transpositions, or rather, you do the natural thing to send one to five using consecutive transpositions, and then you do an adjustment here. Right. And that adjustment will always be all but the last. So there'll always be two k plus one number of things, you know, the middle thing, and then two symmetric points. So you will always need an odd number of consecutive transpositions. This is also useful in proving that the parity of the number of transpositions of a permutation is a constant. So this is an important, as you can understand. So any transposition is being reduced to odd number of consecutive transpositions, so the parity and so on is not changing. So that can be useful. Okay. Uh, in many places, and certainly is useful in proving the parity, as I was saying. But that's not important for us, so we we'll leave that. Right. right. So now that we are convinced of this thing, we know that the rank is the upper bound is n minus one. Okay. Right. Now, again, okay, the question is, can we do better? So obviously, the thing would be, can we generate the consecutive transpositions themselves? You know, starting with something smaller. So the, the idea is to use conjugation. Now, why am I using conjugations? Because when you take a permutation, let's say this, and before we go into the exact details of what happens in the end, before you take a permutation like this, let's say just this, this transposition, if you conjugate it by cycle, so what do I mean by conjugate? This is a cycle, and then on the left, there is an inverse of the cycle. This is called conjugation. When you do this conjugation, the cycle type does not change, meaning that a transposition will remain a transposition. Okay, so you know that the answer would again be a transposition. Okay. That was my idea of taking this conjugation, and also this conjugation has has a has a rank five isomorphism, so it will give you new new transpositions, and so you will get a lot of transpositions. So the hope is this will be good. That was the idea. Now let's just check it. So when when you have let's say um, these consecutive transpositions. So you start with the most obvious cycle, the most obvious uh, cycle, full length cycle, and then you do this conjugation. And so when you do this conjugation, you obviously know that when you have the inverse of a permutation, this simply just gets reversed, right? Five, four, three, two, one. It just becomes a reverse. Okay. And now you can just calculate this, and you can check that one goes to five. Right. You can do that, and. Now, what's our next goal? I mean, let's we basically do this, do it again, and see if you keep getting new things. And you know, you will get new things, but fortunately, you get consecutive things. Okay, so you get four, four going to five. If you if you again um, conjugate one, one, one five, this transposition with the same permutation, you get four going to five. Okay, and so on. You get three going to four, and so two going to three. So you get all your consecutive transpositions, and you can see that this is just a. It has not, nothing to do with five. You can do it for any n. Okay, so the idea is that well, yeah, you can start with one comma two, and you can take the cycle, and this would be enough to generate all the consecutive transpositions, which generate all the transpositions, which generate all the permutations. So you see, the nature of this solution of the problem was quite natural. You just start with an ar arbitrary generating set, uh, not arbitrary, but sorry, the, the obvious generating set, and then just uh, reduce it and. Apply some. This is a concept from group theory, right? That when you conjugate a cycle type, it does not change, right? So yeah. All right. So two, two is enough, and you can obviously show that the rank has to be two. I mean, with one, you cannot get that. You can show. I mean, you know, it's not cyclic group, but anyways, you can show it. One will not be enough. Right. Okay. So before we move forward to the question of transpositions here. So one one may ask the question that look as a group, you are generating S n using two things as a group, meaning that you're you're to, you're taking inverses as well, right? you're taking inverses as well, and that is allowing you to generate S n with two things. But you promised this is uh, is a semi group topic. And my question is like, what would it mean? How, what would it take to generate S n as a semi group? Okay, meaning if you're not allowed to take inverses, okay. And then my point is that you don't have to worry about that at all. 
because inverses will come if you just take the powers right? because this is a finite semi group because it's a finite semi group there's something like this is what you can do if you want a to the power minus n uh, minus 1 this i mean you can just get this by let's say a to the power n minus 1 if 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 n is the order if or if if a to the power n is 1 then you can get this so you can get the inverse by power so in a finite semi group the question of generating it as a semi group or generating it as a group are the same questions so you may just as well try to generate it as a group because that may be easier so you have inverses and so it's it's a good it's a good thing to have and in fact not just in a finite semi group but any semi group like it's a torsion semi group it's a, if it's a, a no not torsion but i mean sorry any group right if you have any group in which every element has finite order then also you can do the same thing right with every element you can just do the same thing right and so so that makes sense right so we are done with this now let's do the next thing so this just today's uh, content is elementary and this is something that does not need any semi any semi group theory and this is really the point of the whole thing that these questions can be framed in elementary terms the easier versions of them can be even be solved with by elementary means like this is very elementary right? even the next question we'll see will be very elementary but then suddenly when you take subsets of tn like all all uh, functions from n to n in which the size of the image is let's say some particular thing some some n and so or some k some some k then how how much uh, would you need right sorry just yeah then then the questions become difficult like if you try to ask if you ask you know if you take some special sem sub semi groups of all the functions and ask how many um, of them you would need then the question becomes may, apparently the, we don't have elementary solutions okay those answers are still elementary that's why it's really interesting that the path has to go through semi group theory it has to go through some structure theory and so on okay so that's interesting but let's do this question which is a truly semi group question okay you know um we are trying to just figure out the rank of tn okay forget about the thing for the moment how to generalize this for f such that f yeah, basically that's what i'm saying i mean if the size of the image is not n means for functions which are not look we have generated all the functions which have uh, which are uh, bijective right we are just interested in now functions which are not bijective if you can generate them then you can generate all of tn right so those are the functions that we'll be looking at okay so yeah let's right so we come to this problem of finding rank of tn okay so as i said we only need to worry about those functions whose image size is less than n okay so we start with function with image size equal to n minus 1 okay now starting with that the idea is can you get to all functions whose image size is equal to n minus 1 Okay. And remember here, now you have access to all the permutations. You have access to all the permutations. So you can immediately see how generating the group part first can be very useful because groups are highly connected things that you can go from anywhere to anywhere. And that's really what's helping us here to think about it. So the idea is that you rename the domain and the range. Right? Basically, we have two functions whose image size is n minus 1, then I mean, the image sizes can be just renamed and that you can do by just composing by a permutation on the left and the domain sizes can be renamed and such by composing by a permutation on the right. And that's the general idea which you can just do, get all functions with image sizes equal to n minus one, okay? But let's just do an example, right? So an example would be, so we take, so again, I've taken a function f whose image size is four and the function is from, you know, five to five. And so here I've sent one and two to the same point. Now it could be any two points, but it's okay. You just send one and two to the same point. And three goes to alpha two, four goes to alpha three, five goes to alpha four and so on. And then you have G, you have G where, just try to mix it up a little bit. You have another function where one and three go to the same point. And these two points could be different. I mean, different from alpha one, of course, okay. And so you have this, right? Now, Now the question is, how do you 
get g from f using the permutations you can use the permutations right so one comes in as the input right? one comes in as the input it needs to go to beta right um how do you send it to beta right so the idea is that you just send one to one right and then you let one go to alpha via f and then you just send alpha to beta then you just send this alpha one to beta one right now the main issue is about three right the three also goes to beta one right? so it also goes to the same point but so where should you send this three to obviously we should send it to two right because then two is another two is the other thing right in f which goes to the same point as one goes to so just send it to two and then f takes it to alpha one and then this takes care of that and you can understand the rest of the thing is just like a it's just a uh, everything is going to distinct, so it's why we know there'll be no problem. For example, we take four. Let's say four. Right, four goes to four needs to go to beta three, right? So you can just, in fact, you can just send four anywhere. Don't just send it to one and two. Don't just send it to one and two and send it anywhere. Let's say just send it to four itself. Send four to four, right? And then uh, f sends it to alpha three, and then just send send uh, send alpha three to beta beta two, beta. Three, sorry, just send alpha two to beta three, or alpha three to beta three, sorry, and that way you'll be able to you'll be able to take care because now this alpha one will not appear anymore. Oh, um, in the in the in the input right, right, and so it will not appear in the output of f because these are the only two places which have alpha one as the output, and so on. So, yeah, that's simple. So yes, you can generate all of them. Yeah? Now you can just use some sort of an induction. Right? You can just use some sort of an induction, and uh, you can you can get it. But let's just see. So now the the point is that you have all functions of rank n minus whose MS size is n minus one. You want functions whose MS size is n minus two, and you know that even if you can get one of them, you can get all of them, and in the same way you can go. So just we can try to get one of them. Right. So you can just take a function. You can just take a function f and you can take two functions f and g with MSI and minus n. For example, you can take g to be. So we want to identify three things now. That is the whole idea. Okay. So one goes to one, two goes to one. Right. Now you want three also to go to one. So in the next function, you send three to one as well. So now one, two, and three all go to one. But we have to make sure that the rest of the things are not killed. So you just ensure that by sending them to, you know, just fixed points. For the rest of the parts of the functions, okay. and so you can get a function with MS size n minus two. And now you can get all whose MS size n minus two, and so on and so on. So you see, we just need to start it. We just need to start with a function of size whose MS size is n minus one, and from there you can get all functions whose MS size is n minus one, and then you can just go down the ladder like that. And from and yeah, the fact that you can go down is also important. From for n minus one size, you can go to n minus two size, and that you can always do. Right? And so this this kind of ideas will be so will be very important later on as well. Okay, yeah, um, right. And so the rank is two, the rank is two for s n for t, and the rank is three. And uh, now, what is our goal? Now, our goal is to separate the group part and the pure semi group part. So we will have a semi group, let's say, which may have a group component, and you can just Remove the group component by some sort of quotienting. We'll see, but in fact, for sub sub semi groups of T n, the group component will not be important. There will be something called idempotent generated, so will not be very important. But anyways, so that's that's okay. That's fine. In general, it might be important. So I think this is a good place to stop. Okay. So next time we will now just since we have defined the rank function we'll try to study its behavior okay how does it behave under quotienting under taking sub semi groups and uh, what what collections generate if you have a d class and what collections how can you describe them in terms of item importance in terms of r classes l classes and so on and then we'll try to find ranks of certain special kinds of semi groups uh, which will be still general semi groups but special classes of general semi groups okay not examples like tn and so on and then we'll finally apply them later on. so yeah that will probably get in next to next time so yeah that's that's it for today we'll continue the next time and yes thank you